Welcome to Four Quarter Lives, a podcast exploring the profound impact of longer, healthier, and more engaged lives, not only for ourselves and our couples, but also for companies and countries. I'm Aviva Wittenberg-Cox, and on this week's Four Quarter Lives, I talk with Harvard professor Claudia Golden. Claudia Golden is a world-renowned economic historian and labor economist. Her perspective on the issues of women brings an economist lens to issues ranging from the female labor force and gender gap in earnings to income inequality in education. She's published many books on the subject, but we'll discuss her most recent career and family, Women's Century-Long Journey Towards Equity, published by Princeton University Press in 2021. I can't think of anyone in the world better place to help us understand this past century's progress, stumbling blocks, and future opportunities for women, men, and the economies of countries around the globe. Claudia Golden's research insightfully interprets the present through the lens of the past. You may never see your career with quite the same eyes again. So today I am absolutely delighted to welcome one of my very favorite writers and thinkers on all things women and work is Harvard professor Claudia Golden. I've had the joy of following your work for some many, many years. Not your first book, but you first wrote a book about the gender gap 30 years ago, published it back in 1990. So here we are on International Women's Day 2023, some 30 years later, and your most recent book, Career and Family, looks still at ongoing challenges for women combining work and caring, with quite a few books on the American economy in between these two. How do you describe or think about the span of your own career interests, and why and and how long have you focused on this idea of women and work? So I'm a a very lucky person. So I think we're both very lucky people. I think we are. So so I've had the luxury to think about just about anything that interests me. And so when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, American economic historians, and I am an economic historian, were researching the U.S. South and the long arm of slavery in affecting black, white, economic differences. And so my first book was actually on slavery. It was on urban slavery in the U.S. South, slaves in cities. What were they doing? Slaves in industry. We usually think of slaves on plantations. And after that, I began to research the employment of immigrants and their family members in the nation's manufacturing sectors in the period that we call the progressive era, at the beginning of the 20th century. And both of these topics led me to think about women. So the work of wives and mothers was just less visible. For slaves, it was probably more visible than for the immigrant women. So adult women were often omitted from the history books, largely because the sources needed to trace what they were doing, which is really difficult to find. And so I set out to find those sources and to tell these stories and explain why the participation of women in the economy increased. In fact, one could say that the most important change in the economies and in the labor forces of every modern country has been the shift of women from the household into the world of work. I mean, you think about 50 percent, more than 50 percent of the labor force you suddenly increase economic growth by quite a lot. And so that was the basis of my 1990 book. So although it's called Understanding the Gender Gap, the gender gap was the gap in employment, not necessarily in wages. And do you think that's now largely recognized, that reality of the impact, the dramatic impact on every Western economy of the massive arrival of women into work? Is that among economists a... I, I, I certainly think it is. And, uh, it, it, I think we've gone beyond that and said that, that having more education for women makes the world a better place, not just because they're employed and they increase income, but because they are a major part of the caring population and the lives of children are made better. 
That is certainly true, again, all around the world. So your latest book now, published in 2021, describes one remaining obstacle on women's career paths, and you call this greedy work. And you differentiate this from many of the other more common approaches that people are still suggesting trouble women, what women do or don't, what management biases are, what sexual preferences lean. As an observer of over three decades that you've been watching women at work, what have we successfully addressed? What remains? And and what do you mean by this concept of greedy work, which is a wonderful term? Sure. So gender gaps and there are many of them, have narrowed in just about every economic and social variable we can think of that's of importance. So let's think about them. There's employment, there's labor force participation, there's education, professional degrees, time spent caring for children, the ability to get credit on one's own in one's own name, and even the gender gap in earnings. So all of these have narrowed the difference between men and women. But of course, two series can narrow but not be equal. And so you ask what remains? Well, the answer is a lot remains. So the gender gap in earnings, in employment, in labor force participation, in hours of work are still substantial, especially in the U.S. So participation rates for women are much lower than they should be. We know that because they're higher even in a place like Canada. So there's something odd about the fact that in the U.S. participation rates are a bit low. So some part of these differences, especially that for the more educated, is due to what I term greedy work. And you mentioned that. So let me tell you very, very briefly what greedy work is, and we can go into more of it later. Greedy work, we can say, exists when working twice the number of hours, let's say per week, increases your hourly wage. It can be implicit or explicit by more than twice. You put in twice the amount of time, but you get more than twice in terms of your paycheck. So the question is, what does this mean for a couple, a different sex couple with children or with other important care responsibilities? So what this means is that that couple would be financially better off by doing a little bit more specialization. So one member takes the more flexible job. Let's call it the be on call at home job. It's still a job. The person is still a lawyer, maybe even a doctor, professor, administrator. And the other person takes a job that's less flexible. It's more remunerative. And let's call that the on-call at the office job. It's a job that if you're told to jump, you jump. So that is the greedy job. So having the greedy job And having it so that you get a lot more means that you're enticing the couples to do a little bit more specialization than they might want to do. A kind of Fordian model of coupledom. Right. And I imagine that in this greedy work segmentation, the sectors or types of roles that are most greedy are most male dominated. Is that Still true. Well, they, 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 so the ones that are the greediest would be occupations in which the presumption is that there's no good substitute for you. And that's, in fact, one way of getting around the greediness. If you had a pretty good substitute, even one substitute, then if you're asked to be somewhere at 11 o'clock and you have to take your father to the dentist at 11 o'clock, you can just call in your substitute. So these would be jobs in the financial sector, in the banking sector, in law. And in fact, they probably needn't be as greedy as they are. And it's possible that in our new world of remote work, they may even be less greedy. And AI perhaps will have some impact. On yeah, that. I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get there. We'll, we'll come back to this greedy work idea. 
so women now in this 30 year span vastly outnumber men in post-secondary education. And this has been true since even before you published that first book on gender gap. What, what do we win in your economic economics mind if we finally manage to address the really full potential of women? How much has the arrival of women into the U.S. labor force contributed to the economy? You, you say that it's been the major change in economies all over the world. And, and what's the opportunity that still remains for these countries if we get the rest of what is left to pluck and narrow those gender curves down to zero? Right. So the first thing is that women have become a much larger fraction of undergraduates in the U.S. since about 1980. In fact, what's really fascinating and is something that leads researchers to scurry around trying to figure out what's going on is that women are the majority of college students in just about every country in the world. Yeah. Whereas they weren't before. And so the question is, why is that the case? And what are the implications of that? But even though they have been, it's not necessarily the case that they are majoring in the same subject. But even if they are, so even if they were absolutely equal, let's say two law school graduates from the same law school, the existence of this greedy work means that men and women with care responsibilities often take different positions. So, so law is interesting because all these lawyers become lawyers, all these law graduates become lawyers, but some work at Park Avenue firms, that's a street in Manhattan, <laughs> and some work in the more boutique law firms. They're still lawyers and no one's crying about their salaries. They're still doing very well. They're not impoverished. But the fact that couple equity no longer exists in their careers means that gender equity has also gotten bigger with this couple and in the economy as a whole. It's interesting that once I different sex couple throws out couple equity, they essentially are throwing gender equality under the bus. It's a fascinating point that they're different sides of the same coin, the same issue. Yeah. And if you talk, I mean, I talk to couples all the time. This is, this is almost an, an invisible thing that hits so many couples who were pretty committed to being very both equitable and equal at home. But inevitably, as the 30s start to hit and the children and the caring roles come along, what you're saying is there's a sort of natural segmentation of roles because the upside of one person focusing exclusively on these kind of greedy jobs is so great that it's irresistible in a current. Right. But of course, it needn't be so gender imbalanced. Right. And then it's just how does it hit? And do you think COVID taught us anything? What did what did we did it point to any solutions for greedy work or on the contrary, did it just heighten the risk? It really it did. And uh, when COVID hit, I was just finishing my book. I was just finishing the first draft. Yeah. You know, not really finish finish, but Pretty much. <laughs> I'm hoping to see the horizon. Right. And then COVID hits. And suddenly I realized this horrible disaster has struck the world. But I was handed, in some sense, a final chapter. I made it into an epilogue. So the pandemic really magnified all of the issues I was exploring in the book. It was increasing the care responsibilities of parents and those with themselves with older parents. Yet it also created a possible answer to the problem of greedy work. So many jobs due to the pandemic could become more flexible with more remote work. The greedy job could become more flexible and the more flexible job could become more productive. So, for example, 
the greedy job, if we have a greedy job that says you have to go to Tokyo every other week, that's not a job that an individual with care responsibilities could possibly do. So it means that generally she would be excluded from that high paying job. Well, it was discovered that you actually didn't have to go to Tokyo, that this is a trip to Tokyo and we can (laughs) shake hands and pretend that we are together and everything would work out just fine. So the greedy job becomes more flexible. And in addition, the flexible job, because, you know, the person who has to be at home on Thursdays can still Zoom, the flexible job can become more productive. So before I finish the book, I needed to know where the pandemic might lead the labor market. I needed to answer the question, what would this new world of work look like? Of course, we don't know for sure what it will look like. But very, very quickly, as I was wrapping up the book, it became clear to me that it will be changing the workplace for good for a long time and for the good of individuals who have care responsibilities. And, you know, we're still, it's still shaking out. We still don't know. Yeah. But it certainly does look like many of the people I see are in better positions. They commute less. They can live, you know, some of them in Idaho rather than in Silicon Valley. Absolutely. There are <laughs> There are aspects of it that are bad. So no one wants to be the young intern who has no one to talk to. No one wants to go into the office and feel completely alone. But it's really up to firms to use this to make things even better. It's it's kind of like the gender shakeout that takes so many decades. It's like the tech shakeout. It's like COVID finally got people to use the technology that's been at our disposal for quite some time. But it was just a resistant force by people who I, I, I suspect kind of like some of this greedy work structure. But even for my seminar, there would be times when I, I would say, you know, it'd be really great to have someone so speak who's in London. Yeah. Now. You know, I don't really think that the person wants to spend that much time traveling. It costs a lot. We have a budget. Would we have thought of having the person on Zoom? Well, we could have, but it might have, number one, seemed unseemly, like we weren't being really nice to this person. But the main thing was the fact that we had to coordinate everyone had to be able to use it. Everyone had to be comfortable with it. And that's what we did. We sort of forced everyone to be comfortable with it. Absolutely. So so your prediction here to stay and um, up up to us all to adjust to it and that it'll have its good and bad sides, but certainly has impacted this whole idea of both sides of your couple equation, the one who does the greedy work and the one who does the flexible work. That's very interesting. I'd like to focus now on one of the the hearts of your book, Careers and Family, that I found absolutely fascinating and is particularly relevant to International Women's Day, is this kind of zoom out that you did to look at the last hundred years of women's and work history. And you divided it up into these five fascinating cohorts that are rather startlingly and markedly differentiated by a number of criteria, age of marriage, age of having kids, whether or not they had kids, and what you call a career or a job, in what order. It, it's a it's a complex kind of story. And I think you can describe these five ages probably better than I can. Can you give us give us a run at these five cohorts? What were they? Sure. So the best way to explain these five birth cohorts or groups, as I call them, is to describe just three of them. There are five, but it's always easier. Three is a great number. So in describing three, I have two transitions. So consider the first transition from group one to group three. I'll fly over group two. And the second from group three 
to group four, which is not that different from group five. So those are the two transitions. So start with group one. So group one graduated college from around 1900, and these are all college graduate women, from 1900 to about 1919, those two decades. And as a group, they had either family or career, sometimes a, a job and not what I would call a true career. But they they rarely, rarely had both a family and anything else. Some did, but it's quite rare. About 50% of the total group, all of them, never had a child in their lifetime and about a third never married. So it was just very difficult to have both a family and a job at that time. But if we fast forward just a little bit and go to group three, and that's a group that graduated college from 1945 to the 1960s. So we just flew over the Great Depression and World War II. This group was just diametrically opposite the other. So 90% of those who married in this group and 90% of them married had children. This was in the U.S., as well as some other post World War II nations, this was these were the mothers of the baby boom. They separated their lives in having family first and then a job, and some had careers. So, whereas Group One was separated into these two groups, in Group Three, they were the same woman, but she separated her life into these two portions. Yeah, so an, a, just an unbelievable revolution in women's lives from a complete distinction, forced choice between family and work. And then 50 years later, not even 30 years later, I guess, that gap, 90% of them have children. That's that, I found that really startling. Yeah, 90% of the 90%. So I don't want to overest, but it's it's very high in addition the number of children per woman is high. So it's not just have or not have. It's also that they have quite a few. But then what's astounding is that within a blink of an eye, group four, which graduates college from the late 1960s to around 1980, group four emerges on the scene and the age of first marriage just zooms up. It goes from a median of about 22 or 23, even for college graduate women, to something more like 20, between 25 and 27. And they delay marriage, delay having kids to cement their careers. And they succeed a lot than the previous group at cementing their careers. However, at the end of the day, for group four, about 27% never have children. Group five is just a little bit different from group four in that they sort of turn around and say, yeah, you did it, but you didn't do the whole thing. So we're going to have the kids too. We're really going to figure out how to do it. And although they continue to delay marriage and continue to delay children, they manage to have far larger fraction of them have children. So about 21% do. So they manage to do it. Interestingly, one uh, benefits from a contraceptive, which is the pill, and the other one benefits from the technology of conception. Yes, absolutely. And that's another big generational shift. And 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 again, how fascinating in a context where we hear a lot about declining birth rates, that what you're tracking among these highly educated women is that their birth rates actually went up to the levels of post-war women have put your group three. And so... I not, thought, not the number of children. The number of children is still way, way, way lower. The number of children is down, right. but the having, so the percentage of women... That percent have, having is still... Not as high as it is for no, no one's going to do what group three did, <laughs> but they're, they're certainly higher than group five is higher than group four in terms of the fraction having kids for sure. 
I loved your imagery that it was kind of a passing of a baton from one of these groups to the next that we learn from our predecessors and our elders. I, I felt slightly triumphant as I, I as I worked through these hundred years. How do, how do you feel at watching this evolution? And where do you think we've we've come to? <laughs> what your I loved your span comparing Jeanette Rankin to Tammy Duckworth. Maybe you can highlight what does that spectrum represent, and and how do you feel about it? Jeanette Rankin is clearly a group. One woman. She had an incredible career. She was the first woman elected to federal office in the U.S. She was a college graduate. She came out of a very rural background in in the U.S. and was a crusader for women's right to vote. And I love the notion that she, in about 1910 or so, got in a car with a friend and drove from Montana to Washington, D.C. I I would love to have been a fly on that wall. (laughs) I don't know how you did that, how you drove from Montana to Washington, D.C. in 1910, but obviously she did it. If we fast forward, and she didn't ever get married. We don't know that much about her personal life. I would love to see a really good movie about her. There is a movie about her, but I don't think it's very good. Okay, call um, out to our listeners, please, a movie. That's right. Please do a movie about Jeanette Rankin and have that drive from Montana to D.C. in it. And tell me about the her friends that she met along the way and whatever whatever romantic liaisons we know about her. I don't think we do, but you can make something up. And But if we fast forward to the amazing Tammy Duckworth from the state of Illinois, who is a, a member of the House and then a member of the Senate, she is a decorated soldier who is disabled. And one would never know from the fact that she has many children and a credible career and an, an amazing member of the Senate that she has any disabilities at all. And she was the first woman to bring a baby into the halls of Congress, although there are many who would say in the U.S. that there are a lot of babies in Congress. (laughs) (laughs) We can certainly comment on that. I I was just reading yesterday that there's not only now a mom's group of Congress women, but yesterday I think it was tabled the request to have a dad's group of yes. congressmen to fight for paternal rights, which I think is a, a very useful and timely evolution in our in your curve lines. I I also want to throw in just for our international listeners that to your two names I always look up to Ursula van der Leyen who's uh, r- right now been in with uh, Rishi Sunak in the UK trying to uh, broker some accord but she's the president of the Euro- European Commission and she has seven kids before she took on Right so so what's interesting is that she was trained as a physician And even in the U.S., female physicians have more children than others who graduated with them from the same institutions like Harvard. So if I look at the data that I have on Harvard female graduates, a very large fraction always become physicians. And those who become physicians have their, a larger fraction of them have children and they have more children. And so it's an interesting point that perhaps it's because being a doctor is something that is more scheduled, shall we say? So we know that you have X number of years of medical school and then you become a resident. And I know, you know, I am not uh, belittling the problems of trying to get pregnant in between one of these or the other or just right after you're a resident. But it does seem as if they manage to do it, maybe because they're smarter than anybody else, <laughs> but they do manage to do it more than anyone. So the other thing that I did notice about Ursula is that when she and her husband visited Stanford, she was a, it's hard to call someone like her a stay-at-home mom, <laughs> but she did step back for a while 
Yep. But I would imagine that her husband, who's also a physician, I believe, stepped back at other times and that they went back and forth and shared. Absolutely. He, he is probably a, a worthwhile recipient of the Marty Ginsburg Award, <laughs> uh, which we r- routinely dole out when it's merited. <laughs> so, I, I, and, I, and I really encourage people to read this career and family book just for this extraordinary vision you've had of describing this evolution between these five groups and and how it wasn't the women themselves who really made these shifts. It was external factors. It was wars. It was uh, technology, contraception. They were made by history. And the, the untracking and unraveling that history is a fascinating read. So thank you for that. That's a wonderful way to celebrate a 100 years of women. I, I just want to move and uh, we're, we're going to have to end soon. And I, I'm just getting on to the idea of longevity. So we speak a lot on this podcast for Quarter Lives about the impact and consequences of longer lives and these now what we're talking about 60 year careers. Do you think that's going to open new opportunities for women? What, what can we imagine of group six? So I think it has opened up new opportunities. So I think about So think about group four, because group four is the one who's now in their late 60s and 70s. And group four has continued to work longer than any other previous group. So they have worked long beyond the age when previous groups stopped. Many had careers. So if we think about the shift from three to four, four said, I'm going to have a career, you know, maybe I'll have kids, maybe I'll not have kids, but I'm going to delay getting married and delay having kids to cement the career. Well, once they cemented that career, sometimes these evolve, sometimes they're the same over a long period of time. Many don't want to give up that career. It becomes part of their identity. So this group increased labor force participation rates at age 55 from the 1990s to the 2010s. So in the U.S., labor force participation rates have been quite flat, but there's one group that has had a huge increase in participation rates, and that's women over the age of 55. And when we look back who those women are and track them, they are group four. So group four women said, I'm going to stay in the labor force. Group three women, many of them were teachers, and teachers do retire. Uh, Whether or not it's because they burn out, whether or not it's because they receive a nice lump sum at some point as their retirement income. But they retired. The group four women have really stayed on. So predictions, you want, you want to throw your hat in the ring on my, my theory <laughs> is that women may now actually arrive at some of their very best career years later than is traditionally true in our up to now male normed economy and in, in what I call their, their third quarters of the 25 years after 50. Do you think your stage five women will reveal that too? This post empty nest newly empowered and sort of massive wave of now very experienced women in all walks of life? Well, I think that, yeah. Of which you're not a bad example yourself. (laughs) Well, I, I actually am always amazed when I read some of my own work from 10 to 20 years ago. Pretty good stuff, I say. (laughs) <laughs> so uh, I rarely read my own stuff, but when I do read it, I think, gosh, that is pretty good. I should continue working in this area. <laughs> so, But it depends upon the field you're in and how fast it has advanced. It's really difficult for anyone to keep up with fast moving changes in coding languages, for example, and the vast sea of knowledge that's out there. I'm glad I'm an economic historian. History never gets old. (laughs) Okay. 
So this is true that it's hard to keep up fast pacing, both for men and women. So when we revisit this idea of couple equity and we see that inevitably, if if this economy doesn't shift fast enough, we're going to have couples making choices in their second quarter, the 450, that could eventually be flipped or reversed or seen to have different versions in their third quarter. So do you, do you see any hope for couple equity over lives instead of over this fairly unrealistic? Yeah, so much fun. Right, well, we were oh, just referring to Ursula. Yes. And, and to Marty. The problem, of course, is to devise that perfect long term contract. <laughs> so I had a colleague. You got to stay married. <laughs> well, stay married, but you also have to have to enforce the contract. And sometimes enforcing a contract is to have an enforcer, which is or else I leave. So so I had a colleague at the University of Pennsylvania very, very fine economics department. And he left to take a position at a lesser institution, not not a really bad institution, but a lesser institution, because long before he promised his wife that after a certain number of years, she would choose the institution and he would move. And he kept his promise. So how many would actually do that? I don't know, but he did. Very interesting. And I think I think really useful from this book to to distinguish between these concepts of couple equality and couple equity. And that I think yes. we all need to become much more attuned to negotiating our contracts on couple equity early on and right. be familiar with those terms because we're lose we are losing out at home if we don't get that right. Exactly. I mean he had he and his wife had couple equity at any moment we might look at them and say there isn't equality, but there was couple equity. Yeah. So in conclusion, 2023, are you optimistic? Do, you, do how, how much longer do we have to keep you working on this topic, Claudia? Do you think we'll reach both work equity and couple equity in our lifetimes on a more, well, you know? So, I think equity is in the eyes of the beholder and have maintained the notion that I describe what is and what was and not what should be for every person. I know what would make me happy, but I don't know what would make everyone else happy. But these lines, these gaps that you've seen narrowing over time, do you think they'll are, are they inevitably on a contracting basis or do you fear for some kind of reversal in trends? And that this, this is why I'm an economic historian. I'm incredibly good at predicting the past. <laughs> Does it repeat itself? <laughs> are we going to keep on these trend lines? I don't predict the future. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay, I'll leave you alone with it. <laughs> but I do love your metaphor that these five cohorts of women have passed the baton of learning and understanding from one age to the next. You have done that so generously with, with all the women who followed in your steps or just have learned from your insights. So I can't help but have one last question, which is any recommendation or advice that you might have for your our listeners as they negotiate their own combination of work and home. So I would say that if you are fortunate enough to have the luxury to do what you want to do, then follow your deepest passion. Find that other person who wants what you want. And who will be with you forever. And sometimes that person has a tail. (laughs) (laughs) I'm hunting for a puppy right now. (laughs) Claudia Golden, thank you so much for your time, your insights, and your decades of encouragement and observation of our communal past. Well, I've enjoyed this very much. For more thinking about the impact of our four-quarter lives, you can read my column at Forbes and subscribe to my Elderberries newsletter on Substack. Let's design lives that aren't just longer, but better.